Have you ever wondered what technology does to your brain? Yeah? Do you ever think about video game addiction and what it can do to your attention and your aggression? Do you ever think about how social media affects your brain? How it can perhaps make you feel even more lonely than you were without it? I do. Do you ever think about that? Interesting. Here we are, another video, book review. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I have been reading quite a lot and I've recently finished Mind Change. And this is a, a book about how social media and digital technologies can change your brain for the good and for the bad. Now, if you're watching this, you're probably wanting to know what it says. So, let's get into it. So, this book, it was published in 2015 by Susan Greenfield. Field? Greenfield, why did I say it like that? And uh, it talks about how technology can rewire your brain and how it can change the way we see and react with the world. And it e explains some interesting and like really complex neuroscience in a way that someone who doesn't have a background in science can understand. While this book is quite quite hard to read, I would say, there are a lot of big words and my brain is little, so I have a bit of trouble reading it. I had to reread re and reread a few <laughs> pages and paragraphs over again, but it explains it in a way that for someone who doesn't have a background in neuroscience, it can understand all the intricacies and basically take away the big picture. All you need is like a basic understanding of how the digital technologies can influence your brain. And I think that's interesting. So let's get into it. So first we need a little bit of context onto who Susan Greenfield is. So Susan Greenfield is an English neuroscientist, she's an author, she's a member of the House of Lords, which is like the upper house in England. And she's one of the leading um, minds in the research between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. She took a doctorate in philosophy in 1977 and conducted her thesis on Azermazumadem and Jimene, I think. I don't, that's how you say it, maybe? Acetylcholinesterase. That's as, that's as close as I'm gonna get. <laughs> and yeah, she conducted her thesis on the study of this fluid in rabbits and how that fluid cools two parts of the brains called the, the substantia nigra and the chordate nucleus. Basically, there are two parts of the brain that form the nigrostriatal pathway, which is one of the major pathways in movement. A zhuma 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 is an enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of acetylcholine, acetylcholine um, as a neurotransmitter. And acetylcholine itself actually causes muscles to contract. And thus, you can see why it is attributed to movement. It can also activate the pain response, regulates endocrines, and is fundamental in our REM sleep. Deficiencies in acetylcholine can lead to muscle weakness, and the fancy term for that is myasthenia gravis. Gravis? Gravis. After graduating and years of teaching at Oxford, she was promoted to a university professorship in 1996. She served as a director on the Royal Institution from 1998 to 2010. What's that, 12 years? Yeah. 
but that takes so long to think. And from there, she founded her company, Neurobio, which is a company that has a therapeutic focus on neurodegenerative diseases. And they have discovered the compound T14, which is a neurotoxin that could be a potential key driver in neurodegeneration in the elderly. Sacho is journeying to the center of mind towards a state of consciousness. And this is where she asks some of the most interesting questions about your own state of consciousness and how you can derive this state from a grey blob with the consistency of a soft boiled egg. How can molecules form emotion or constitute any ideas? Another book, Private Life of the Brain, is another one of her books where she looks at um, interesting questions about consciousness and emotion. A couple are what happens in the brain when you drink too much alcohol, get high on ecstasy or even experience road rage. The, the Human Brain, a guided tour, talks about the structures of the brain and looks at how drugs and injuries can affect it. it dis and it also discusses brain development, consciousness and individuality. Tomorrow's People, which is probably the closest predecessor to this book, it just basically talks about how we could be susceptible to this new digital age and how it could affect our brains and our potential vulnerability to the new technology. And yeah, so as you can see, there's quite a theme going on with her work and it's all, I would say, pretty interesting. And I don't know, I didn't really know about her before I found this book. And I found this book a long time ago. I just thought it looked cool and I was interested in the topic. So it took me a while to read it, but we're here and yeah, let's talk about what it talks about. So some of the main concepts in this book, she describes how the brain works when the brain becomes the mind, because in, in this conversation, they are two different things. Your brain is the physical, and your mind is what your brain can create, basically. It also talks about how searching, searching, surfing the web, um, how social media and video games can affect your mind. This is why it's called mind change. But it also can have effects on your physical brain, such as like rewi rewiring your neurons and stuff like that. And how those things can affect like instant gratification, your memory, your emotions such as like happiness or like sadness, loneliness, and even aggression. Dopamine desensitization, attention span, just a bunch of things. So the first thing she goes through is how the brain works. And basically, and basically how it does work is you just have a lot of neurons, a lot of neurons. And neurons are brain cells, right? And when a brain cell, a neuron fires, it sends a tiny electrical blip through the cell down, which lasts a thousandth of a second, and it zooms down the tail into the next one. However, there is a gap, which is called the synapse, where the electrical signal stops. However, because that blip creates a chemical messenger that travels to the next cell, and they have sort of a, a molecular handshake, but it's such a tight fit that they usually call it like a key and lock mechanism because a molecular handshake just doesn't. And when these molecules interlock, the chemical energy is then transferred into electrical energy, which triggers the next neuron and therefore the cycle repeats. And this transfer from chemical to electrical engineering engineering, there's my engineering coming through, from chemical to electrical energy is called excitation and from there the next neuron can either say yes to this slight change in voltage or no which is called inhibition and then the electrical path stops. An interesting thing I learned about this book which is sort of unintuitive to what you may think is that the brain doesn't designate one part to one specific action. So not one part of your brain controls this finger, not one part of your brain controls emotion, not one part um, controls your attention. They all 
all the regions work together. So while one part may be active during a certain action, it's not necessarily the only region that has a role in that action. And these regions, they're, fundal they're fundamentally made up of neurons. And these neurons can rewire to any sort of stimuli, stimuli from your senses. And your senses could be smell, sight, touch, Here's a quick lesson on the five senses we have. Sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch. Thank you. You know, all those, <laughs> all those senses, I forgot them all just then. And these senses can be interpreted through emotion, and these emotions can help what changes your brain circuitry. And we know this, like, you can link the winter time to a happy thought because you usually sit by a warm fireplace during the winter time and drink a hot chocolate or you could link the rain to an unhappy emotion because you remember that one time that you were stuck outside walking home from school or from work and it was just pouring down and you didn't have an umbrella this is why positive reinforcement is so much more effective than um scolding a pet or a child when they've done the wrong thing and the problem is the brain can't tell the difference between different situations. So it can't tell the difference between the feel good hit when you take a line of cocaine and the feel good hit when you eat a burger. So there are these addictions that you can form that are not necessarily healthy for you or good for your survival but you get them anyway and you form these addictions and this is why giving up smoking is so hard this is why giving up drugs is so hard this is why people get addicted to video games which we'll talk about a bit more later and yeah like I said the brain sees these things as the same thing but the mind doesn't and this is a key difference that they talk about in the book so when the brain becomes a mind when does this big grey blob turn into the mind, consciousness, thoughts, emotions. How do you take stimuli from your senses and turn it into a conceptual idea, attach emotions to it, and form experiences, have memory? Because in, at the end of the day, you're just a brain in a vat. Your skull is the spaceship and you're just moving through the world stuck inside your head, literally. Think about it. Anyway, the brain is very literal. It is either right or wrong, it's either one or zero. Because the neurons, they're either off or they're either on. You get me? Like, they either fire or they don't. And when they fire, they rewire, and we get this cycle. So the brain is a physical part that we can see, however the mind is invisible. It's almost intangible. We don't have any um, characteristics per se for it, but it transcends the worlds of thoughts and feelings. It gives you thoughts and attitudes, beliefs, imagination, and the mind is mostly associated with consciousness and philosophy. And by making assumptions from context, by taking those environments and situations that you lived in and decoding them into a way that makes sense to you. And when you're trying to simulate how the brain works, the mind is the problem. A brain is more or less simple, however complex it is, it's either one or zero, which is how computers work. Binary, one and zero, they sort of interchange. However, to make ones and zeros develop its own personality, have its own beliefs and attitudes and way of thinking is obviously the issue that people that are researching this are finding. How to make a computer think for itself, basically. And this is all the 
the the Terminator movies and like there are so many dystopian and utopian views on AI and when robots start to think for themselves. And there have been mainly two ways of doing this, one's from the bottom up to simulate the brain and then use that foundation like we're doing now with modern day computers to model the the mind and how it thinks and how you develop um, a personality and things like that. And then there's the other way where you try and model the mind in a plastic and regenerative way and then try and that you try and use that framework to develop a functioning do get this do that physical um, machine. However, when you assume that the brain works like a one and a zero and it has a linear progression to get to a goal, well, we all know that that's not how it really works. Like, the brain, it gets distracted by other stimuli, what you see, what you hear, memories, like, it's never a start here, end here process when you're trying to do something. You often get distracted, you can procrastinate, it's never unemotional. It's never black and white, it's never one step, two step. So when you think about when the brain becomes the mind, it's when you transition from log logical thoughts to con contextual driven thoughts. The brain gives the facts and the mind decides what to do with it. So in saying this, how does the brain give the mind the opportunity and how does the mind interpret this information? Why does it do this and why do we need the need for privacy and a need for attention? So the next part of the book is about social networking and social media. Why do we have social media in the first place? Well, we are social creatures. We have a desire to be connected. We have a desire to feel belonging and we like to know what's going on in the world as well. Social media, as everyone knows, it has a multitude of good and bad implications on society and your individual health. Reaching out and chatting to a friend to see if they're okay or talking to a family member that you haven't seen in a long time. These are good applications of social media and I believe that this is the original purpose for it. A way to bring us together, a way to connect in a way we've never been able to before. And this, in a way, is an indirect way of making you feel good as a person. Social media is something that's contradicting in a way that it's something that's supposed to bring us closer together and in a lot of ways is pulling us all apart. The sole purpose of making a post has gone from a selfless thing to a selfish thing. A like, a comment, a share has become the driving force for someone to post on social media and it's no longer about checking up on your loved ones it's about seeing how many likes you get and the bigger they are the bigger that number is the bigger your self-esteem is and the happier you are and this obviously has some negative impacts on your mental health you begin to value yourself on what other people say and of how many likes you get. You begin to value yourself off people who don't even know you and their opinions about you. Why do you let someone who knows nothing about you dictate the amount of self-esteem you have? Well, the book in the book, it says that when we aren't met with positive feedback, we feel threatened. When things aren't going right, we feel scared. So over time, we become to crave approval, and in this case, it becomes quantity over quality. It becomes the more likes you get, no matter who they're from, that's how you value your importance. Like, when you hurt yourself, it's, it's not about who heals you, it's not about what heals you, it's about when. And the fastest way to make you feel better about yourself is to post something and have people like it and that's just a quick and easy way to get a short-term burst of dopamine but because of this short-term 
sacrifice, we're left feeling more alone and more upset in the long run. And when you start posting the content that gets you the most likes, you you get stuck in a chokehold. You either post what you like posting or you post what gets the most likes so you feel the best. And for most people, they start posting what gets the most likes. And so if you post that butt pic on Instagram and you get a thousand likes, you feel great, but you aren't that butt pic. Like, that's just your butt. So, yeah, it feels great to get a thousand likes, but those thousand likes don't mean anything except that you have a nice butt. It's not about what type of person you are. It's not about who cares about you. It's just about your physical attributes, and they're often the most shallow. And then, on top of this, there's people posting their own butt pics on Instagram, and they're getting more likes than you. So, your butt is the best thing about you, but your butt is not as good as everyone else's butt. So that makes you feel even worse about yourself. It's just a horrible cycle. And that's not to say everyone posts their butt on Instagram. That's obviously not what happens. But it's just a common analogy, uh, an easy way to explain that not being true to yourself and not posting what you want to post is going to lead you to be more unhappy in the long run. Being someone that gets the most likes, being someone that is liked, liked by everyone else, isn't going to be what's going to make you happy. And you see on Instagram, on social media, everyone is living their best life. Everyone is smiling, they're happy, they're traveling, they've got expensive stuff, they've got a happy relationship and you start looking you start comparing and because of these social media algorithms they feed you what you want to see so the more you look at these people who are better than you living a better life than you the more they're going to show you and like we we all know how that makes you feel it just shows you that everyone's happier than you Everyone has a better butt than you. Everyone is smarter than you. Everyone is prettier than you. Everyone is has better hair than you. Everyone is better than you in every single way. And that is horrible for your self-esteem. Why does everyone have a better butt than me? Why? I can't take it anymore. All you have is a thousand likes on your butt pic, but it means nothing. And yeah, people aren't what they post. Like, they're photoshopped, they're filtered, they only post the best version of their lives, you only post the best version of your life. And that's something that you need to take into consideration. You're only seeing a version of them that they want you to see. And yeah, you might be doing this as well. And because of that, who you are on social media isn't actually you. It's a version of you. It's a part of you. There's not actually who you are. Think about the amount of time and the amount of person you put into whatever you post. Like you, you post a picture, sometimes you post uh, a caption or a video. Even a video that would be 20 minutes long. That's 20 minutes out of your entire lifetime. That's only a minute percentage of who you actually are. A picture is even less, and a caption is even less than that. So, to, to believe that everyone's life is better than yours, or everyone's better in every way, it's just not true. What? So they're not better than me? <gasps> because you're not who you post on social media, and neither are they. Social media also influences loneliness and it turns out that loneliness is terrible for your health it's shown in a study that was referenced in this book that women with less social relationships are twice as likely to have a stroke than those with more after adjusting for all other possible factors like no wonder we avoid being alone like it's a plague it's not only mentally damaging but it's physically damaging too like it's physically affecting your body 
So why do we choose to do this? Well, to put it simply, Facebook gives you the feeling of companionship without any of the effort. All you have to do is press like and people feel supported by you. And you don't have to put any effort in at all. And you still get the same dopamine hit and you still get the same feeling. To be a true friend, you have to have a real understanding of how a person will will react in certain situations. And you just don't get that through social media because like I said, you only see a very, very small percentage of what that person's actually like. So you don't actually know them if you just like their picture on Instagram. And so there's no empathy, there's no growth in trust between two people because that is built through understanding someone, talking with someone and having like face-to-face -face contact with someone. There are so many non-verbal ways of communication and you just lose all of that when you go online. Like non-verbal communication is almost as important if not more important than verbal communication. And it's just this lack of body language that leads to a disconnect in our communication. And it's just another reason why we feel more alone than ever. It also says in this book that that fact can have a detrimental impact on a child's development. Like not growing up around people and learning to communicate through a screen instead of talking to someone, instead of playing with other kids. They don't recognize social cues they don't they can't develop empathy they have no trust in other people because they haven't ex gone through experiences with them and this can lead to a large number of social implications growing up not having people around and not talking to a wide range of people from a wide range of backgrounds they could be they could be punished for saying the wrong thing in the social setting they could be bullied as a kid for not being able to speak properly like there are so many negative detrimental impacts that it could have on a on a kid growing up because these days bullying doesn't just happen at school like this technology seems to be a double-edged sword you spend a lot of time growing up on technology so you don't develop social skills so you get bullied at school for not having social skills so you go into technology but the bullies are on technology as well so they have you at all times of the day and that is one of the leading reasons why teenagers feel alienated pre-adolescent teens younger ki kids even down to preschoolers why they feel like they have no friends because not only do they have trouble talking to people but the people who are telling them that they have no friends and people that are telling them that they can't make friends they have access to them 24-7. And when you have that type of constant reinforcement, it's hard to it's hard to not believe it. And kids and people with poor social skills, they often look for an escape from the real world. Whether it's reading, writing, a type of art, or more commonly these days is video games. It can hold a bubble. A withdrawal from the real world that can be dull at times it can be stressful at times and video games can take you out and put you in a place where you can be a better person of you you can translate attributes that you wish you had into a character that you can play so effectively you can be anyone you want to be in the game and if you could do that why why would you want to live in the real world? Why wouldn't you just spend all day every day playing video games? And this, being addicted to video games, also can have a detrimental impact on your social skills. So, there's just this massive vicious cycle, like kids growing up with technology and games, they don't develop social skills and la di la di la. It's just this vicious cycle and it's something that parents need to look out for especially during the early years because if you can stop this from beginning it's much easier to stop it before it starts than it is to intervene when it's too late but why do we play video games well since the dawn of time people have seeked pleasure fun the the old saying of wine women and song 
or the more the more modern version would be sex drugs and rock and roll like people have forever been looking forward to the desire of just enjoying themselves a way to have their senses stimulated with no time for self abstract thought or self conscious introspection video games can be the ultra rendition of all three of those things you can have all three of those things without any consequence in the real world you can you can hijack cars you can rob banks you can kill people you can do so many things in video games that have no consequences you can just respawn and do it all again or choose to live a completely different life with no consequences with no ramifications and do things you wouldn't otherwise be able to drive recklessly jump off buildings the list goes on there's no there's no denying that these things are enticing especially for a younger audience a risk taking it. someone that is looking to experiment and is looking to try things they've never done and to explore what happens if I do this what happens if I do this like it's no secret that being able to do that with no consequences isn't going to be an addicting venture everyone has heard of the 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 gamer who does nothing all day but stay inside on the computer drinking Mountain Dew and eating Doritos like that is a common stereotype for people who play video games but a common question is in this book is like when whose fault is it is it the person who's addicted to video games is it their fault for getting addicted in the first place or was their brain chemistry developed in a way to where they would be more they would be more susceptible to being addicted and this this presents a a chicken or the egg sort of scenario does an unusual brain feature create an unusual behavior or does the unusual behavior create the unusual brain feature? This is an increasingly complex and difficult question to answer. The chicken in this case, gaming, does it leave an impression on your brain? Where in a, in a study from Simone Kuhn at Ghent University in Belgium has mentioned in the book where gaming is linked to the expansion of the striatum, which is the region responsible for the sensory motor function in attaining goals, where dopamine enhances this experience and sweetens the the reward. And she reflected on the on the plasticity due to this dopamine release. And she found that the, the more time spent gaming, the larger this impression was in their brain and can cause an addictive cycle. The other idea is, of course, that the the pre-existing uh, pre brain condition can leave you more susceptible to an addiction to video games. Another study by Kirk Erickson at the University of Illinois found a correlation between the size of the dorsal striatum and the success in video games. And this highlighted the important role that the striatum plays in in it in itself being a rich source of dopamine. And this might be consistent with people who can be more susceptible to being addicted. However, like, it's impossible to determine whether someone is just inherently going to be more predisposed or whether they are addicted from indulging in it too much. The main upside from a video game would be to, like I said, become someone that you're not or to enhance your good features whereas like if you weren't inherently strong you could become a character that was if you wanted to be the best basketball player you could be LeBron James in 2k you could play as Cristiano Ronaldo in FIFA you can create a character in these games that is yourself and you can tailor their stats to however you want and you can effectively create yourself the way you want to be in this game. And these these skills could either mirror yours or they could yeah become what you wish you had. And this could lead to obvious lowering in self-esteem. You're not the person that you want to be. You're not as good at good at things as you want to be. And it can also reaffirm your laziness and the feeling of not getting anything done in the real world like 
you can be easily distracted and play for hours and feel worse for not having done the thing you were supposed to. And also, like, given this, could video games negatively affect your attention? Because the video game that you designed your own character in, that you are exactly who you want to be, that is more exciting, that is designed specifically to grab your attention and hold it for a long amount of time, is that what you want to be doing with your time? Something that is designed for you, something that your brain enjoys, or the dull, boring world that you have to work hard for things, you have to play by the rules. It's just like, when you say it like that, there's, the question seems silly, but it's not all bad. It has been shown that video game, like r frequent people who play video games are better at certain tasks than those who don't. It's, it's shown that some gamers <laughs> make better drone pilots than real life pilots. It's shown that in a study that some, they took 50 gamers and they put them through a variety of visual, visual spatial tests and it has shown that they were faster at seeing and remembering images or numbers faster than the average person because of the nature of the games they were playing. They, they were required to see and determine whether or not an element in the game was a threat or not and this translated over into seeing and counting how many circles were on the page before they disappeared. So yeah, a number of these repeated tests were done in a controlled environment and it was, it did show that there were certain benefits to moderately playing video games. There were, there were some positive impacts and if utilized correctly, they could help people. Like it's, they used the game Fruit Ninja to rehabilitate stroke victims. Um, it's shown that the elderly playing video games, it helps reduce their neurodegenerative conditions if they use their brain more often by, while playing video games. It has helped their, their, their neural health better than those who weren't doing anything. But yeah, the question still remains whether the video games are distracting from the light, from life, or an escape from it. And this also leads on to another issue where the stereotype where playing violent video games can make the player more violent, give them more violent tendencies, have a shorter temper, be more aggressive, all these things. But it is stated in this video that the only way this would happen is if the brain confuses the two. If it confuses the video game for the real world, this is the only time that a crossover in beliefs and attitudes could happen. But then it goes on to say that humans don't live in a vacuum and it's hard to say that video games are the sole responsibility for people being more aggressive in their day-to-day -day lives. Like, the average gamer may tend to be more aggressive, not because of the video games, but because of how they were raised, what situations they were brought up in, and just a bunch of different contextual things. But it's also said that in games, where the character you're playing is rewarded for aggressive actions, this can trigger dopamine in your brain and fire the neurons, and like they say, neurons that fire together wire together, so for the character that is rewarded for aggressive behavior, this could potentially rewire the player's mind into thinking aggression is going to be re rewarded in the real world as well. And a study was done where males who played a first person shooter had their brains scanned and analyzed and it saw that while they were playing these vi violent video games, the areas in their brain that controlled emotion and empathy, those were inactive, which can explain why when you're playing Call of Duty, there's a, a teenage boy screaming over the mic that he's going to kill you because you killed him in a game. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Don't kill me. No, don't kill me. No. Ah, I'm going to kill you. How could you do I am going to kill you. this game. Mm. Like, 
you're you're desensitized to the real world and you're also you tend to do things that you wouldn't normally because your brain is in a, a different state but there was a very important point in this book where aggressiveness does not mean anger they're not the same thing there is a distinct difference and while video games may or may not increase aggression this does not necessarily mean they're more likely to punch holes in walls or hurt another person aggression has many other forms but anger really only has one and that's really all the the common concepts in this book another thing i'd like to add would be like this book it was published five years ago and if you think about it five years ago the digital landscape was completely different to what it is now things changed so quickly online that books that were written over one or two years ago are almost outdated but in saying that a lot of what this book covers and a lot of principles that it talks about are still fundamental and they still ask questions that we don't really have answers to yet if you are interested in neuroscience how the brain works and you're interested in the philosophy in like how things rewire your brain and what you can do to foresee any issues and how you can change your daily habits in your life to benefit you and the people you care about like knowing what's in this what's in this book can help you raise your kids in a, a healthier environment it can help put social media in perspective it can help you feel better about yourself in a roundabout way like there are a lot of things that while this book is quite hard to read at times it is beneficial the the principles and the information in there is very important especially in in the day the age of technology so there are a few other videos that i'll link in the description that susan the author she gave a ted talk and also she gave another talk at another conference and it was talking about how digital technologies affect the brain and she's quite well spoken uh she actually wrote the book so she knows more about this than i do i would recommend go watching them as well if you're interested and uh yeah i'll put a link to this book in the description as well if you do want to go buy it but yeah that's about all i've got um hopefully this video isn't too long i've I've filmed quite a lot today, but yeah, follow me on Instagram, and I'll see you later. Bye.